Today on No Greater Love with Pastor Jeff Kramer. Paul is, is speaking to national Israel or to the nation Israel, to the Jews, and saying that, listen, historically, here's the problem. The problem was unbelief. And while God has a remnant in the nation of Israel, and he cites all of that, and he says that God's not done working with the nation of Israel, there's still a work to be done. He goes on and he says, Gentiles, don't be knuckleheads and start being anti-Semitic in your view and thinking that, you know, hey, I've got this salvation all down and everything. You know, get out of here, Jews. We don't need anything to do with you. And he gets down to the final points here of, of sharing that Israel is going to be delivered as a nation. They're going to be delivered uh, during the tribulation time. But the understanding is, is that not every single person, every living Jew at that time is, 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 is going to be regenerate and, and, and embrace Jesus. Not everyone is. The Taking the cross for us, no greater love than innocent blood. Welcome to No Greater Love with Pastor Jeff Kramer. The Jewish nation of Israel are God's chosen people. He chose to use them to birth the Messiah and gave him as a savior of the world. As we read scripture, it's so important we understand how God has and is working with Israel because they play a major role in biblical prophecy. Israel is a distinct people group God has chosen to work with and the church is a distinct people group God has chosen to work through. Both are important and both are distinct in scripture. As we pick up our study today in Romans 11, Paul reflects on the relationship between Israel and the rest of the world and God's plan of salvation. We learn how God is not done working with Israel nor has he rejected them. However, salvation has been given to both the Jew and the Gentile. Let's dive into our study we've titled, Some Believe. And now, here's Pastor Jeff. And, and as, he, as he puts it down here in the Greek, here in the New Testament, and as it's translated into our English, this is how it comes out. God has given them a spirit of stupor. So, so now we're into another word. Another crazy Greek word is katanaxis. And, 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 and while they were blinded, that pu-ra'o, the loss of the power to understand, now there's a spirit of stupor, this katanaxis. This is all about the emotion and the mind being unaffected by the offer of salvation. Because they didn't understand what, what, uh, who Jesus was and what he was bringing, because they rejected him as the Messiah, that blindness came in. They lost that understanding. That understanding went to a place of stupor that impacted the emotion and the mind, and they were unaffected by the offer of salvation. Now think about this, gang. Think about how many people are unaffected by the offer of salvation. Our churches, we might fill our churches up from time to time. There might be church plants going on around the globe. We might have all these wonderful live streaming broadcasts and radio messages and all of that stuff. And all of that stuff is wonderful and great and needed. And may God continue to support it until he's finished with it. But there are still so many millions upon millions upon millions upon millions in our state, around our, our country, and around the globe that have not embraced the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And so for many of you, perhaps the time of Easter is something, well, I've done Easter so many times as a Christian, and you know, I've just kind of, it's just kind of lost that thrust here for me. Listen, may we never, never, never go to that place where we lose the vibrancy and the life-giving aspect that Jesus has brought to us and the excitement that comes from knowing about the resurrection of Christ and, and how it seals the promise to us. May we never lose sight of that. But if we do lose sight of that, God forbid, may we, be, may we be turned and restored, okay? What's going on and what Paul is writing about here about what happened to the nation of Israel is that, listen, they lost the understanding of that and their emotions and their mind are completely unaffected by the offer of salvation. He moves on down. And now 8b, Romans 11, 8b, this is crazy, stick with me, Okay. Uh, he goes on, he says, eyes uh, that they should not see and ears that they should not hear to this very day. Well, what is he doing here? Well, that last portion, he's quoting Deuteronomy 29, verses 3 and 4, uh, which says this. He says, the great trials which your eyes have seen, the signs and those great wonders, period, 
Yet the Lord has not given you a heart to perceive and eyes to see and ears to hear to this very day. Listen, the hardening of the heart, what happens? How does that happen? It comes through a spiritual drowsiness. All of, the, all of the, the, the commandments and the promises and what they saw, what, what the nation of Israel saw as they came out of Egypt, they saw God fighting for them and doing a wonderful work. And yes, we're of the seed of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, you know, our, our, our forefathers, the patriarchs, all of that stuff. And God worked with them in such an, a wonderful and a powerful way, yet the hardening of their heart happened and it came through that aspect of spiritual drowsiness. And gang, I don't know if you can identify with that one-on-one, apple-to-apple type of thing, okay? I don't think we can, but I know this, that in the weakness of my flesh, there are seasons that I go through where I feel like I get tired in the Lord and before the Lord. Not of God, okay? God forbid that should ever happen, but I get tired. And when I get tired in the Lord, guess what? I lose perspective. Guess what happens to my mind? Guess what happens to my emotions? Guess what happens to the way that I see my circumstances? Everything gets tweaked. And when it all gets tweaked, what do I want to do? I want to start running and gutting and pedaling and making it up and doing my own thing and start, you know, jockeying and shifting and jiving. And next thing you know, I'm Jacob. I'm a heel catcher because I'm manipulating my way instead of staying put before God. That's powerful. That's powerful. All because of a spiritual blindness comes on and it sets in. I, I, start, I start majoring in the minors instead of majoring upon the love of God. I want to fight over stupid doctrinal issues. I want to get all religious. Well, church, why don't we do this? And why don't we sing those songs? And why isn't this happening? Why isn't that happening? Well, there's all kinds of reasons. All that is real stuff. It's real fights. It's real battles. It's real struggles. But man, this spiritual blindness that, that, that fell on them. Well, we get to point number three. Uh, back in our text, you know, verses 13 down through 25, big section here, okay? Uh, this, these particular verses, uh, I put the title on this or the point on this is that um, Gentiles, that would be you and I, don't be ignorant. Don't be ignorant. Verse number, number uh, 13, it says, uh, for I speak to you Gentiles, okay? So he's calling out very specifically here, in as much as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousies those who are my flesh and save some of them. You know, he, he wants to bring forth this zeal in his own countrymen. The nation of Israel, okay? He says, for if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Oh my goodness. Can you throw John 5 and 24 on the board here for all of us? John 5 and 24, it says, most assuredly, Jesus speaking, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into to judgment, but has passed from death into life. Listen, if we hear the words of Jesus, if we hear this, God has is, is done something amazing. And what Paul is saying, he's saying, listen, man, check this out. He says, listen, they were cast away. God kind of put the pause button on them. There's still a promise. There's, there's still you know, work that God's going to, be, to have happen. But right now, he's gone out to the Gentiles. And, and as his word has gone to the Gentiles and all of that stuff, just think about how awesome it's going to be when Israel comes to their senses in the tribulation period. And all of a sudden, they recognize, they accept, they embrace Jesus as the Messiah. Oh, my goodness. That's what he's saying. Verse 16, he says, for if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. Now look to your neighbor right now. Look to your neighbor and say, I'm confused. <laughs> that is an appropriate response. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not that it's confusing. Okay, I'll explain what it is. Uh, but it, it's, it's, man, we'll start talking about all kinds of stuff that you and I, it's not part of our life. It's not part of our everyday stuff that's happening here. And so when we come across and we, we read scripture, we can get to places like that and go, what? There goes one side and there goes the other side. And then the next thing you know, I end up going like this. I close the Bible. Either that or I do, you know, crazy Bible reading. Okay, God's done speaking to me there. And uh-huh, I'm over here now. You know, I flipped the chapter. Okay, having a good understanding of this. Overall, the particular section is, listen, 
uh, don't be a knucklehead, Gentiles. Don't start boasting about this. Don't start boasting about that. Understand here a few simple principles. So in verse number 16, he says the first fruit and the lump. Okay, what is this all about? Well, this goes all the way back to the Old Testament. This goes all back, you know, to, to the law. And, and, and what God has set in place there is, is that, listen, they were to make that offering to honor the Lord with the grain, okay? Whatever the, fruits, the first fruits, if you will, that came in, that was the deal. They were to honor the Lord with that. And by honoring the Lord with that first fruit, guess what happened to the rest of it? Because they would use that grain to make dough and, you know, and, and all the other stuff that they would eat and so forth. He says that if this part is committed to the Lord, the first fruit, that's holy, great. And so is the lump. And I can go everywhere with application on that. I'll just refer you to what the Lord had for us as a fellowship last week. Honor the Lord with the first of your increase, okay? Now that's an application. That's not an in-text deal right there. And so uh, he says that, and then he goes on down here, and he starts talking about the root and the branches, okay? What is the roots? Well, the roots are the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, okay? They are the root. They're, they're the root. They're the foundation of national Israel and all that stuff. Now, what are the branches? The branches are the descendants, okay? The, so you have the root coming from the patriarchs, and the branches, as they've gone up of this olive tree, this is the nation of Israel, Okay, and the nation of Israel draws everything right back to that root, which is the patriarch, Abraham, the father of faith, etc., 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 as we move on down. Now, a couple things perhaps we could learn about the olive tree, and I wrote these down here in my notes, so I'm just going to read them to you. That olive trees, you know, these, uh, these things live for hundreds of years. Olive trees are it's nuts. But as the olive tree ages, there are some branches that actually stop producing olives. Okay, it's important that we understand this from how they would read it because they would understand this stuff. You and I, I mean, we're lucky if we even see an olive tree, okay? Unless you go to Israel, right? But, but, but the, the point is, is that when that olive tree would stop, you know, producing olives, what would happen? They would use a younger tree and they would graft it in. Super interesting as to how this, how this happens. And so what, what Paul is taking is he's magnifying this and he's going, uh, he's going a little bit farther with this. Uh, let me read verse 17 and uh, uh, 18. He says, and if some of the branches were broken off, and you, watch, and you, speaking to the Gentiles, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. Okay? So he's saying, you're a wild olive tree. Now, we know this about wild olive trees. Uh, and, and, and I read this during my studies this week. Uh, I had somebody send me a text uh, saying something to the effect about um, wild olive trees, they don't bear fruit. And I, and I think that's right. So if you're watching online, I think you're right in that. They don't bear fruit, but they bear nubs, okay? And so the wild olive branches or the wild olive trees, what happens is there's like this little green heart thing that it pops out there. And I don't know if it sounds exactly like that, but something you know, you, you have that happen. Okay, so whatever sprouts on it it, it, it doesn't turn into something that is like luscious and, you know, that you can pick and eat and all that stuff. So the grafting in that Paul is talking about is he's using these agrarian agricultural things, what they were accustomed to, they got it. Because to bring something back to be fruit bearing once again, they would do the grafting in. He's merely just saying is that the Gentiles are like a wild olive tree. Now, when you graft it in, guess what happens from that root? From the root, okay? The nutrition and, and all of that stuff is not supplied on the branches, okay? It comes from the root. So as they're grafted in, and there's a crazy illustration. You can, you can actually Google this and see how they actually graft these trees in. It's wild how they do this. But, but the grafting into the root means that all the nourishing, the, you know, the, the, whatever the sap and nutrition is that comes from the root, it begins to, f to feed the branches. And those branches, because they're being nourished from the root, they produce fruit because they're grafted in. Okay, that's what Paul's saying here. I know we went a long way about it, but, but that's the whole deal. And he's saying, listen, verse 18, he says, don't boast against the branches. Don't, don't get up there on your lofty little perch and say, well, if Israel were just this or, you know, those Israelites and, you know, and you start having a cow and, you know, become all anti-Semitic and all that stuff. He says, don't do that. Understand what your position is and don't be ignorant as a Gentile. He said, God has something special. 
But as they were broken off and you were grafted in, you don't deserve it. And that source of blessing is not being generated by you. It's coming from the root. So don't take salvation for granted again and don't trash talk against Israel. And we move on to our fourth and our final point here for today. And that is in verses 26 down to 32. Uh, that as Paul goes forward, I guess I'll read verse 26. He says, and so all Israel will be saved as, as it is written. The deliverer, let me read that again and catch your attention. So all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but, but concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. And he moves down there from there. I need to make sure that I, I bring understanding and I'm glad that you guys have awesome Bibles right before you because in those awesome Bibles, hopefully at verse number 26, when you see that it says, and so all Israel will be saved, you see that word saved there, hopefully there's a little asterisk that is next to that word in your Bible. If there's not, get a better Bible. You need some notes in there. And that asterisk should give you a reference to a footnote and that footnote tells you really what the historical meaning or the Old Testament meaning, the flavor that was taken from the Old Testament and, and is poured forward. And, and even as Paul is quoting Isaiah here, he's giving us a better understanding. And though he says all Israel will be saved, the idea is, is from this English word that he's using, saved, is not like by way of salvation, but it means in the Old Testament, it means delivered. That, that all of Israel is going to be delivered by the Messiah. How? When and where? Through the tribulation period. Understanding that the nation of Israel, Old Testament Israel, that the church is not replacing Israel. That God has a special work to do. And when we read the book of Revelation and recognizing and realizing this, and as Paul comes to the place, and I'm giving you Paul's words and commentators' words and even perhaps even your own Bible in, in the breakdown of, of, the, uh, uh, of the Greek words, He's taking a Hebrew from Isaiah, put it into Greek, and you and I are reading it in English. Yes. Oh, how? I don't know. Okay. He's merely just reflecting to this, is that not all are going to attain salvation, but they're going to be delivered by the Messiah through the tribulation period. That's what that means. Wow. I had no idea. Okay. And so not every living Jew at Christ's return to the earth is going to be regenerated. He doesn't mean that. Only the ones who embrace Jesus by faith. Now, some of you are like, what? I've been around. I've been walking with Jesus forever. I didn't understand. I didn't know. I didn't care. Okay, that's cool. Let me give you a couple of reference points, and I'm hoping that you can throw these on the board. Ezekiel 20 and 38, maybe? All right, pop that baby up on the screen right here. I will purge the rebels from among you and those who transgress against me. I will bring them out of the country where they will dwell, but they shall not enter the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Ezekiel 20 and 38. Well, Albert and Zuck, they got a comment uh, in their commentator, uh, their commentary on this particular thing. They cite this as the understanding of that not all of Israel is going to obtain salvation, but Israel will be delivered as a, as a nation or as a country during that time of, of the tribulation. Next one, John MacArthur, in the same thread of this, John MacArthur goes up, he, he cites Zechariah 13, 8 and 9, which says, and it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die, but one-third shall be left in it, continuing, I will bring the one-third through the fire, will refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people, and each one will say, the Lord is my God. So, so recognizing, understand this, great scholars, great commentators, great people that study the scriptures in the Bible, I'm not making this stuff up, I'm, I'm just putting the pieces of it together. And, and I think that the takeaway and the understanding that we need to once again wrap our minds around is in Romans 9, 10, and 11 that Paul is, is speaking 
to national Israel or to the nation Israel, to the Jews, and saying that, listen, historically, here's the problem. The problem was unbelief. And while God has a remnant in the nation of Israel, and he cites all of that, and he says that God's not done working with the nation of Israel, there's still a work to be done. He goes on and he says, Gentiles, don't be knuckleheads and start being anti-Semitic in your view and thinking that, you know, hey, I've got this salvation all down and everything. You know, get out of here, Jews. We don't need anything to do with you. And he gets down to the final points here of, of sharing that Israel is going to be delivered as a nation. They're going to be delivered uh, during the tribulation time. But the understanding is, is that not every single person, every living Jew at that time is, 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 is going to be regenerate and, and, and embrace Jesus. Not everyone is. But we know that 144,000 will be. And there's a very specific number that is attached to it. And so... I would, ref I would refer you to dig deeper should you desire to inquire into that stuff. And so um, the chapter closes out in this way, uh, verses 30, verses 32, and, and maybe this will be a, a, a decent application for us or, or maybe a reminder for us. He says in verse 30, he says, for as you were once disobedient to God, yet now, or yet have now obtained mercy through their disobedience, even so... These also have now been disobedient, that through, th through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. For God has committed them all to disobedience, that he might have mercy on all. Very interesting, because he goes back and forth here, and he uses disobedience, and he uses mercy four times in these few verses right here. And disobedience is this. Hear me on this, Christian. As, it, as, as he has disobedience in here, this speaks of the condition of being unpersuadable or obstinate. Being unpersuadable or obstinate. A wonderful cross-reference if you'd like to read it, Acts 19, verses 8 and 9. But he also puts mercy on there. And why the condition of man, specifically the nation of Israel at this point, that disobedience or the, or the, 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 the Gentile disobedience prior to coming to faith in Christ, of, of being in a, a, a tough spot so where we're obstinate against the Lord. Yet it is the mercy of God, which we also see used four times in these verses. And this word, mercy, this is a word that is filled with emotion. And what does it mean? It refers to God's inclination to relieve mankind's misery. Amazing. God, give me some mercy. Relieve my misery. And then the chapter closes because we've just had our mind blown in 9, 10, and 11. Great, if you can teach all the intricacies of that, more power to you by the Holy Spirit. May we learn of you. But all the great commentators that I have been reading and going across for these past several weeks and also over the past seven years, their minds are just as... <laughs> so I stand in great company of telling you that may God impart to you a better understanding where you need it, and I've done the best, and you know I was sweating to get through chapter 9, 10, and 11. We have arrived here at this, and chapter 11 closes. Maybe this is the third close, so we got to be done, okay? It, it, it closes this way. He says, oh, in verse 33, oh, the depth of the riches of both the wisdom and the knowledge of God, exclamation point. And here's what I would say, amen, amen, and amen. Read the final three verses yourself. This is... <laughs> Wow, my goodness, that's intense. That is super intense. And so here's what I would love to do. Or here's what I'd love to say. I'd love to say as the worship team is coming up, but I, I need you to pause where you're at, okay? I wrote, this is special because I wrote it down on a piece of paper coming here. This is super special. You ready for it? Who do you say Jesus is? He's so my goodness, wasn't that special? That was special. Because it all comes all the way back to who do you say Jesus is. That's all for today. Join us for our next broadcast of No Greater Love with Pastor Jeff Kramer, weekdays at 1030 a.m. No Greater Love is an outreach ministry of Westminster Calvary and is supported by listeners like you. If you would like to partner with us, please text any dollar amount to 84321. We would like to personally invite you to join us for our weekly worship services Sundays at 8 or 10 a.m. and Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. 
We are located in Westminster, Colorado, on the northeast corner of Church Ranch and Wadsworth Parkway, near the Vasa Fitness. If you're not local, tune into the weekly live stream on our web campus, app, Roku, or on Apple TV. Have you downloaded the free Westminster Calvary app yet? You can stay up to date on coming events, join a small group, request prayer, and watch live worship services. Just search Westminster Calvary on your favorite app store today. Lastly, we're a church that's ready to serve you. If we can do so, give us a call at 303-223-4640. And remember, there's no greater love than when Jesus gave up his life for you and me. Thanks and God bless.